day everyone once again you're welcome to another wonderful learning session today we'll be looking at test of hypothesis we will continue our study on test of hypothesis and the focus for today will be a t test so we have looked at parametric test for z test we have looked for a proportion today we'll be looking at the t test and as a practice we would consider a bedrock for success for today remember the last time we looked at counsel from proverbs 6 from verse 6 to 9 that told us go to the ant learn from her ways and be wise who having no overseer and no guide provided their food in summer because they have gathered in harvest and the in continuation, we will look at from verses 9 to 11 of Proverbs 6. It says, How long will thou sleep, O sluggard? When will, that when will thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Think of it. Procrastination, they say, is a thief of time. Some people have sleeping as their hobby. And they are not embarrassed to say it. What's your hobby? My hobby is sleeping. The Bible classifies such as a sluggard. It says, when will you arise out of your sleep? There is a time for everything in life. When we are supposed to be walking, if we are found sleeping, then when we are supposed to be resting, we'll be found walking. There's always a proverb that says, walk while you have the time to walk so that when you are supposed to rest, you will not be found walking. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to sleep, idleness of the highest order. And it says, what will happen to such people? Poverty will come upon them as one that travelled, and I want as an armed man. I pray that this will not be our experience. We looked at how tirelessly the ant works. Let us be industrious. Let us not continue to give ourselves over to much sleeping. There is a time to rest. There is a time to walk. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we are grateful to you for counseling us from Proverbs chapter 6, verse 9 to 11. In verse 6 to 9, you reminded us to go to the ant and be wise. From verse 9 to 11, you are reminding us once again that we cannot continue to sleep and expect things to work out well for us. We cannot continue to engage in idleness and expect prosperity. So, Father in heaven, we pray that you help us to know where to draw the line. Help us to know when we need to rest and help us to know when we need to walk. So that when we are supposed to be resting, we will not be found walking. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice. And as we go through the topic today, grant us insight and understanding. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. At the end of this topic, you should be able to do the following. One, know when to use a T-test. We have already established it under the Z-test, when a T-test should be used. But we would re-emphasize it again. You should be able to calculate the test statistics for one sample test using the T-test statistics. You should be able to calculate the test statistics for two sample tests using the t-test statistics and you should be able to make your deductions based on the tested hypothesis. For the z-test, we did for one sample and two sample. For the proportion test, we did for one sample and two sample. Today we are doing for the t-test and we are also going to do for one sample and for two sample. Steps in hypothesis testing. Recall that the first step is state the null and alternative hypothesis. Know your level of significance. Calculate your mean, your standard deviation, if it is not given. But sometimes they will give it to you as a sample standard deviation. But in a situation where it is not given, the same formula you use for your standard deviation in descriptive statistics, summation x minus x bar square over n. The only thing in hypothesis testing is that your n becomes n minus 1. Compute the appropriate statistics or the T value using the appropriate formulas and obtain the calculated value and compare the calculated value with the tabulated value. If it is a two-tailed test, remember you're dividing your level of significance by two 
and if it is a one tailed test you are using your um, alpha directly if the calculated value is less than the tabulated value it means it falls within the acceptance region so we accept the null hypothesis but if the calculated value is greater than the tabulated value it falls in the rejection area so we reject the null hypothesis and make our conclusion now choice of probability distribution in hypothesis testing recall that it was stated that once population variance or standard deviation is given whether the sample size is small or large a z test is used now the reverse is the case once the population variance or standard deviation is not given and what you are given is the sample standard deviation or you are required to calculate your standard deviation yourself then the t test is most appropriate most times it is always given when the sample size is small if the sample size is less than 30 t test is the most appropriate test statistic so that's those are the two conditions that makes the, that qualifies you or qualifies one to use a t test distribution now let's look at this question a typist claims that she can take dictation at the rate of more than 135 words per minute of the 12 tests given to her she could perform an average of 120 words with a sample standard deviation of 40 is her claim valid as usual the first thing is to read the question again a typist claims that she can take dictation at the rate of more than 135 so is her claim valid now this tells you it's a directional hypothesis because he's saying i can take dictation at more than 135 so that will be the alternative hypothesis the 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 null hypothesis will state that the claim is not valid she cannot take dictation above the average level which is 120 so we would state the hypothesis this way the claim of the typist is not significantly different from the average the average given is 120 so her claim that she can take dictation at more than 135 me is not valid the alternative hypothesis this should be h1 states that the claim of the typist is greater than the average her claim that she can take dictation at more than 135 word per minute is valid meaning her h1 ratio mu is greater than 135 so this is a one tailed test so let's get the variables the sample mean is given at 120 the population mean is given at 135 her n which is a sample size is given as 12 and her sample standard deviation is given as 40 now the question is how do i calculate my standard error my standard error is, is st sample standard deviation all over root n minus 1. this is the formula for calculating the standard error so 40 divided by root 12 minus 1 gives us 40 over root 11 which is 40 over root 3.316 which gives us 12.06 so this is our standard error so to calculate our t value 135 which is the claim of the typist minus the average over standard error over 12.06 so the t value is 1.24 now how do we calculate so this is our t calculated in the case of a t-test, you'll be comparing t-calculated with t-tabulated. Now, how do we get our t-tabulated? Unlike the z-test, where you will divide your level of significance by 2 or get the exact level of significance and start searching through to know where it falls within. In this case, you'll just go to your student t-distribution on your statistical table. And your student t-distribution on your statistical table T distribution on your statistical table can be found on page 14 of your statistical table. That is a percentage point of the student T test distribution. So if you're using the new statistical table, you can find it on page 14 of the statistical table as compiled by Amos and Ibikuni. But if you are using any other statistical table, just look for the student T test and then you'll be able to get it. So you need to check whether your, 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 your degree of freedom is slash your alpha or it is just your one minus alpha. Some 
will give you as one minus alpha. That's that's to say that they are giving you those values in confidence level, not in level of significance. So you need to check out for it. So in this case, it is slash alpha, so which is slash our level of significance in your statistical table. So the degree of freedom, it says at one percent level of significance so the confidence level is 99 percent okay so how do we check it go to your alpha and you would see where you find 0 0.01 on the horizontal axis of that page 14 0 0.01 can be found on 1 2 3 4 5 6 on the sixth colon of the first row. 0 0.01 and your degree of freedom is n minus 1, which is 12 minus 1. So you check 0 0.01 under 11 and you trace it down. What do you have there? The value is 2.718. So just like you sketch your Z test, you can also sketch this. It is a one tail test and it is a right tailed test. Because even your calculated value is a positive value. So you would draw your diagram and put it on the right side, 2.718. Now, if you put your T calculated, you see that it falls in the acceptance region. So you are accepting your null hypothesis. Why? Because your T tabulated is greater than your T calculated. So do not reject your null, which implies that her claim that the dictation she can take at more than 135 is not valid. So that is that. Since T tab is greater than the T cow, we will be accepting the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis states that her claim that she can take dictation at more than 135 is not valid. And that's the conclusion. Now let's go to T test for two sample. So if the population variance or standard deviation is unknown, and the sample size is less than 30, a t-test is still recommended. Now, how do I calculate my t-value? Now, recall that in the first case, where it was a one sample, your t-test, um, your t-value is simply calculated as your x minus mu over standard error. But in this case, you're going to be comparing x1 and x2. And that is because mu1 will be equal to mu2. So mu1 minus mu2 will give you zero. So you can ignore the mu part, the population mean. So x1 minus x2 all over, not just your standard error now. All of this can be a means of calculating your standard error. You have to calculate your pooled variance into square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. Your sp represents your pooled variance. So the formula for two sample on that t-test is x1 minus x2 all over sp into 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. So how do we calculate our pooled variance? Our pooled variance is square root of first sample size minus 1 into first variance plus second sample size minus 1 into second variance all over first sample size plus second sample size minus 2. Now your degree of freedom is your denominator here, n1 plus n2 minus 2. So your n1 is size of sample 1, your n2 is size of sample 2, your S1 square is variance for sample 1. Please note, this is variance, not standard deviation. So where you're giving your S, you need to square it. And the second is variance for sample 2. So combining that formula, which is your S being to 1 over N1, so you can simply say your T calculated. Don't be scared that this formula looks very long. Just look at the logic behind it. This is the formula for your pooled variance sp into square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. So bring the formula of sp here and multiply by 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2 and find the square root of everything. And then you get your t value. Your sample variance is given as, remember your standard deviation is square root of this. So your sample variance is summation x minus x bar 
all square over n minus 1. The only difference is minus 1. In sample variance 2, it will be your second sample minus 1. So those are just basic things to take note of. Let's take an example. The average number of articles manufactured by two machines per day are 250 and 200 with a sample standard deviation of 20 and 25 respectively. Now, in this case, you are giving your standard deviation. Sometimes they could give you a sample size of 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You are to now calculate the sample standard deviation of that 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So where you are not giving your sample standard deviation directly, please, you can always calculate it for 25 days. Now, on the basis of 25 days production, so meaning both the first sample and the second, both the first um, machine and the second machine with this sample is sampled for 25 days. Can we conclude that both machines are equally efficient at 5% level of significance? Now, you agree with me that this is a two-tailed test. They didn't tell you whether one machine is performing better or lower than the other. Are they equally efficient? So the first hypothesis will tell us that there is no significant difference, meaning they are equally efficient. They are equally efficient. Both machines are equally efficient at 5% level of significance. Or there is no significant difference in the efficiency of both machines. Mu1 is equal to mu2. Your H1, please, this should be H1. Your H1 will tell you that both machines are not equally efficient at 5% level of significance. Or there is a significant difference in the efficiency of both machines. So H1 is equal to, is ratio mu1, is not equal to mu2. This is a two-tailed test. Now, let's bring the variables given. X1 is 250, X2 is 200, N1 is 25, N2 is 25. Your sample standard deviation is given as 20, so the variance will be 20 square. Your sample standard deviation 2 is 25, so the variance will be 25 square. Now, the formula x bar 1 minus x bar 2 all over pooled variance into square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. Remember that pooled variance is given as n1 minus 1 s1 square plus n2 minus 2 minus 1 s2 square over n1 plus n2 minus 2 all square root. Now bringing the two, you have this. So put it into the formula x bar 1 minus x bar 2. Your x bar 1 is 250 minus 200. You see that this is very simple and straightforward. All over square root of n1 minus 1. Your n1 is 25 minus 1. Your sample variance is 20 square plus n2 minus 1, which is 25 minus 1, into the second variance, which is 25 square, over n1, which is 25, plus n2, which is 25, minus 2, into 1 over 25, plus 1 over 25. Very simple. So, do your board maths, your arithmetic. 250 minus 200 gives us 50. 25 minus 1 is 24 into 400 plus 24 into 6 to 5 over 25 plus 25 minus 2 into this. When you multiply 24 into 400 plus 24 into 6 to 5, what do you have? 9,600 plus 15,000 over 50 minus 2, which is 48. 1 over 25 plus 1 over 25 is 0.08. So as usual, solve using board mass. Open what is in the bracket before you find the square root. So this plus this gives us 24,600 divided by 48 multiplied by 0 0.08. At the end, we have 50 over square root of 41. Square root of 41 is 2.5304. 50 divided by this gives us 19.76. So our T value, which is our T calculated, is 19.76. So, no matter how long a formula is, it can actually be broken down. Now, let's go to our T tabulated. The degree of freedom as expressed initially, N1 plus N2 minus 2, which is 25 plus 25 minus 2, which is equal to 48. Recall that it's a two-tailed test. So, you're going to be doing alpha over 2. And it is given at 5% level of significance. Remember, the other one was at 1%. So, always take note of your level of significance. So 0 0.05 divided by 2 gives us 0 0.025 into 48. 
So by the time you check 0 0.025, which is on your 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, on the fifth colon, and check it under 48, you may not get 48 directly. But if you look at it, it's given in values of, you have, you have 30, you have 40, you have 50. So you pick the one under the 40, because this tells you that it is all the range between 40 to 49, before 50 starts here. So 0 0.025 under 48, pick under 40, you have 2.021. So that's the range. So decision, this is our T tabulated. And our Z calculated was 90, calculated was 19.76. Our T tabulated is 2.021. So since T tab is less than T cal, we reject the null hypothesis, which implies that both machines are not equally efficient at 5% level of significance. So we reject the null hypothesis. Another way of determining that is to use your diagram. So this is a test statistic, it's a two-tail test. So this is 2.01, that's your critical value, and minus 2.021. Now 19.76, which is your z curl, falls in the rejection region. So from the diagram, it is also observed that 19.76, which is a calculated value of our t-test statistics, falls within the rejection region, which allows us to reject the null hypothesis that more put machines are equally efficient. I hope this is simple enough. Today we have looked at how to calculate the t-test for one sample and the t-test for two samples. Please keep practicing. Practice several questions until this thing becomes a part of you. There are several questions in different textbooks, several questions online. Lay your hands on them and practice them until they become a part of you. God bless you till we meet again. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for the lecture of today. Our prayer is that everyone that has tuned into this channel will get, will get an understanding of this topic and that when it is expected of them to put it down, may they put it down correctly. Thank you for answered prayers, Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. God bless you.